rights level, but also in an intellectual discourse on the uh, on the rule of law, uh, that uh, I think this issue should be subject of uh, our uh, special attention. I would like to thank Riga Graduate School of Law for cooperating on this uh, series, uh, for accepting our invitation to be part of this series. And I would like right now to ask uh, Professor Yanis Ixtens, uh, acting rector of the Riga Graduate School of Law uh, for taking the floor. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm uh, very pleased to welcome you here at uh, this inaugural event of the of the series. And um, uh, it just so happened that uh, the first event is held on the fifth uh, on the 25th of March. Uh, the 25th of March is a very painful day for Latvians because more than 40,000 people were deported um, on the 25th of March in 1949 by the Soviet authorities. And uh, this uh, extremely painful uh, memory uh, is uh, a, uh, an example of a complete disregard for human rights, complete disregard for rule of law. And therefore, uh, you know, uh, the fight against communism was not just about, you know, personal freedom, uh, ability to consume, but it was also very much about the rule of law. Uh, now, more than 30 years after the Soviet rule is gone, uh, well, issues surrounding uh, the rule of law uh, are still on the agenda. Uh, and uh, although the, the, the system uh, of governance has changed, we see that uh, there is uh, an abundance of problems with the rule of law, not just in Latvia, not just in Poland, not just in the Central and Eastern Europe, but also elsewhere in the world. And, uh, you know, corruption, uh, use of office for personal or political gain are just some of the aspects uh, to this uh, overarching problem. And therefore, I'm uh, very happy that uh, uh, SWPS University has joined forces with Rio Graduate School of Law on this series, particularly with a view on, on the mission of RGSL, because we, have, uh, we were established uh, more than 20 years ago uh, you know, with an explicit aim to somehow change this uh, culture uh, to, you know, uh, uh, inject new ex uh, expertise among uh, the judiciaries of the region and also beyond. Therefore, I'm, I'm really pleased that this event is taking place. I think that this uh, spring will gradually uh, uh, develop and I don't think that it would be very nice to say, uh, you know, a fall of or autumn of, of the rule of law, uh, but maybe we can uh, somehow continue uh, uh, this. And uh, you know, there is always spring somewhere on the earth. Uh, therefore, uh, maybe we can just uh, you know attract some Australian universities so that they can you know have do their part of the spring. Uh, but um, in any event, I really wish. Uh, uh, very uh, exciting discussions, and I'm also very pleased with the very format of this event. So there is, uh, you know, an interaction uh, between, uh, uh, you know, established scholars who have uh, uh, impressive tr uh, academic track record. So their interaction with younger colleagues who are about to begin their academic careers. Thank you very much and uh, I wish uh, exciting discussions. Thank you, Rector Extens, for uh, introducing us uh, to, the, uh, to the webinar uh, and for uh, sharing this uh, hope that we'll be able to contribute to the discussion and also maybe to involve some uh, other partners into, uh, into this endeavor. And right now I would like to ask uh, Rector, uh, Professor Roman Cieślak, Rector of the SWPS University in Warsaw. Good morning, everyone, uh, or good evening to Australia, as, as we said before. 
thank you for, for the invitation. I'm very pleased uh, to be invited to say a few words at the beginning of this webinar. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to welcome the keynote speaker, Professor Martin Krüger, uh, the panelists, Dr. Alexandra Marcesco, uh, Dr. Michał Kradoszyński, and of course the host, Professor Adam Bodnar. Uh, and all the audience and participants of this um, important event. Uh, I'm grateful that together with the Riga Graduate School flow represented by Director Brianis Ixtens, I'm attending the opening of the webinar series, Spring with the role, Rule of Law in Central and Eastern Europe. And I hope that thanks to this initiative, the topic of Rule of Law will flourish in our academic communities. And thus, hopefully, it will inspire change beyond them as well. Um, the pandemic accelerates and sharpens many social and political processes. We cannot be proud, some of them, but um, in every and difficult situation, we should look for what gives hope for growth and positive change. Uh, I think that this webinar is a good example that um, academia not only takes up difficult and important topics, but also identifies them more precisely, gets more involved and cooperates better with other stakeholders. Uh, this is a huge and needed transformation and a good example for our societies and politicians from all countries. Um, as WPS University wants to be a part of this uh, transformation. Um, I wish you an inspiring meeting, openness in scientific discussion, discussion, and thank you again for taking part in this webinar. Thank you. Uh, dear Rector Cieślak, uh, uh, dear Rector Ixtens, thank you very much for those uh, introductory remarks. Uh, I would like to say that today's uh, webinar uh, is composed of two parts. During the first part, we'll hear the uh, speech by uh, Professor Martin Krieger, who is our keynote speaker. And then we'll, we'll hear two comments from two uh, scholars of, I would say, uh, of two uh, very emerging and specialists uh, and scholars into the sociology of law. Uh, Dr. Alexandra Mercescu from the West University of Timisoara in, uh, in Romania, and also from Dr. Michał Krotoszyński, who is assistant professor at the Department of Theory and Philosophy of Law of the University of Adam Mickiewicz in, in Poznań. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce uh, our keynote speaker. First of all, I would like uh, by, to say that I remember Professor Martin Krieger, and I have this personal memory from one scene. It was a scene uh, in 2017 when uh, we held a Congress of Polish Lawyers in Katowice, a big event uh, that was devoted to protest against changes in the Polish uh, legal system in the Polish uh, judiciary. And I remember uh, the passion, the intellectual passion which uh, Professor Krieger had in observing what is happening in Katowice at this time when lawyers are uh, being together, are uh, assembling together in order to protest against changes, in order to express uh, the concern. And I remember that during our travel from Warsaw to Katowice, we discussed why is it so? Why is it so that we are at this very special moment when lawyers need to be in such a protest uh, move, uh, mood? And I think that Professor Krieger has this very special uh, intellectual uh, capability of analyzing what was happening because he is really one of the renowned uh, global experts on rule of law, affiliated uh, on a daily basis with the University of New South Wales in uh, Sydney, uh, but also co collaborating with a number of uh, institutions, including some uh, teaching in Budapest at CU or some teaching at the, uh, at the Polish Academy of Sciences um, uh, every year. Uh, Professor Krieger is author of many uh, publications published in uh, renowned journals and uh, publishing houses. Uh, and he was uh, quite recently rewarded with the member, with the 
uh, he became the member of the Order of Australia for his um, dedication and for his contribution to the intellectual uh, scholarship on, uh, on this issue. So if we can say that there is like a Polish man being in uh, Australia, somebody who is not only a global scholar, but also somebody who is deeply understanding the context of the uh, legal, social, and economic transformation happening after 89, not only in Poland, but also in a whole Central and Eastern Europe, and who is uh, able to put like a very general intellectual uh, uh, oversight on uh, what, what is happening uh, in this part of the world, it is Professor Martin Krieger. Martin, Professor Krieger, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very, very much. It's, it's hard to say anything after such an introduction without lowering the tone, but I'm honored in general to be here. I'm honored to be part of this enterprise and delighted because of the importance of the subject and the engagement of so many people uh, in, well, throughout the world, but particularly over some years in East Central Europe. Central among them, I should say, in, in revenge, is Adam Bodnar, for whom I have simply unlimited admiration for his role as Ombudsman of Poland in very difficult circumstances to which he's risen with heroic and unstoppable, untiring dedication. Uh, I'm also grateful to both universities and to both rectors for promoting this event and to everybody who has been involved in it. Let me, though, now focus on, on our subject. The title, as you have read, otherwise you wouldn't be here, is The Ideal of the Rule of Law and why it matters. And I should explain a couple of things about that. I'm focusing on the ideal of the rule of law. And so part of what I have to say will try to explain why I think that is the place to start. Even if you don't agree with one other thing I say, and such people exist in the world, I found, uh, I hope that you'll be persuaded that we should take the ideal of the rule of law seriously and start with it. The rule of law, as everybody here knows, has had an extraordinary rhetorical career over the last 30 years. And events in East Central Europe are no small part of that career. Of course, the concept of the rule of law and the concept, the ideal of the rule of law is a very old one found in many civilizations. And I'll say something about it shortly. But the term, in English or in its various uh, other incarnations in different countries, was not always a popular term, was not always a term that people in a wider society knew. Lawyers knew it and used it, but people in the wider society didn't. I believe that a central reason for its worldwide use and abuse as a term was the collapse of European communism in 1989 in your part of the world. Because what that represented, among many other things, was the end, of, of course, the end of the Cold War, but the end of a world historical struggle between two powers, ideologies, systems, economic, political, legal, which claimed domination or legitimacy as models everywhere in the world. And then, poof, Communism collapsed in Eastern Europe and then in Russia. And only one of these world historical competitors was left standing. And central to it was a package which we're familiar with, democracy, liberal democracy, market economy, rule of law. And it looked as though there was nothing else. There was nothing else. And so you had the famous, unfortunate as it turned out in retrospect, phrase, the end of history. And even people who didn't endorse that phrase or that language didn't come up with many alternatives. And from that time, the rule of law was seen as central to what was called transition from despotism, from communism, from uh, failed states, from uh, uh, civil war throughout the world. And billions of dollars have been spent on rule of law promotion. Billions of dollars, many thousands of people have been involved in it. 
The rule of law has become one of those hurrah words like justice, democracy, human rights, which whatever people do, they know not to oppose rhetorically. That is, it's a term that everybody has something good to say, whatever it is that they're doing. Or at least it was until recently, because things have changed, as everyone knows, over the last 10 or 15 years. From the end of history, we come to the title of another book, No One's World. We are living now in no one's world where there is no monopoly rhetorical package which everybody has to subscribe to, where there are real challenges from China, from Russia, from populist and other authoritarian governments, several, many, so several in your part of the world, but not exclusively in your part of the world. And when these challenges are happening, it seems to me important to get clear what this rhetorical label is about. Now, one way of doing it, and the most common way of doing it, is to try to come up with some definition of the rule of law, to point to some institutions, independent judiciary, uh, separation of powers, or to some laws, human rights laws, constitution. And after all, after 1990, every country in Eastern Europe got constitutions, constitutional courts, etc. There was a huge amount of legal activity on putting together institutional packages which were thought to amount to the rule of law. Now, I think that that is the wrong way to try to understand the for many reasons. The packages are varied. They work in some places, not others. They work for some problems, not others. The problems may stay, but the institutions change. When Aristotle said that the rule of law is better than the rule of any individual, he was not thinking of our institutions. But more important, I was struck by, I was reading a short autobiography by the great English novelist Graham Greene, and at the beginning of it, he was a convert to Catholicism. In the beginning of it, he tells of a friend who was attending the funeral of her father, and at that funeral, an old priest who had known her as a child tried to persuade her to return to the church. And so she's asked him, well then, Father, remind me of the arguments for the existence of God. And after a long hesitation, the priest admitted to her, I knew them once, but I've forgotten them. Now, he was a believing man. And so a lot of people who talk the language of the rule of law know the language, but have forgotten why it matters. And some people have never learned the language. A lot of people think, well, the rule of law is just a thing for lawyers, and they're not lawyers, so why should they be interested? Or some people think, well, the rule of law is important, but it is lawyers who should deal with it because it's their problem, it's their expertise, not our problem. These are, I think, deeply mistaken views, and I hope in the next few minutes to uh, persuade at least some people on the screen uh, that uh, that. The rule of law is important, not just for lawyers, not especially for lawyers, but for us all. Another reason why I emphasize starting with the ideal rather than some trying to label some institutions is that there is a phenomenon known well in organization theory as goal displacement. That is, we find it among bureaucrats all the time. They know the rules and they know how to operate with the rules. But if you ask, well, why this rule? What's important about this? The answers aren't forthcoming. They don't have an answer to that question. Now, if we want to persuade ordinary people living their own lives of what I believe, that the rule of law is fundamentally important for the lives we lead, then it's not enough to point to the rules, argue as constantly happens within uh, legal systems between, for example, Poland or Hungary, and, or Hungary and the European Union to argue over legal details. And I say that 
and I mention Poland and Hungary because they're countries that I'm particularly interested in and know something about, because modern assaults on the rule of law, many modern assaults on the rule of law and the assaults in those countries, are in important ways different from old-fashioned assaults on the rule of law. When Lenin took power in 1917, he announced that the dictatorship of the proletariat was the rule of force, of power, unrestrained by any laws. He said it, it was true, he wasn't apologizing. That's just what he did. That's what uh, military coups all over the world do. But today, generally, not universally, you have Belarusia next to you, and I worked for some years or over some years in Myanmar. Generally, new ways of assaulting the rule of law seem to take law very seriously. But they take it seriously not to uh, serve the ideal of the rule but to abuse it, to subvert it, to hollow out the institutions that support it. To put in place of power channeled, tempered, and moderated by law, their own power unchanneled by any of these things but they do it in a very legalistic way. Uh, one person I've seen in the audience, Professor Uitz, from the Central European University in, in uh, Budapest, or it was in Budapest at the time I was there, uh, was at a conference that I attended in 1970, sorry, <laughs> 2017, uh, where, which was just after the... Uh, Lex CEU was, was begun, and the conference was addressed by the uh, president of the Central European University, um, whose name has escaped me, but he's a very distinguished man, Michael Ignatieff, uh, who, who said with some bewilderment, these were the early days when uh, the government of Hungary was trying to subvert the Central European University, but it wasn't yet clear what direction this was going to take. And Professor Ignatieff said the thing that bewildered him was that what was a, particular, a clear, obvious attempt to destroy the university for political reasons was always handled by lawyers who were making this pedantic point and that pedantic. What about section 21C42? Or so maybe you should have done this a bit more formally correctly. And that is the way that a great deal of contemporary, uh, often called populist, for good reason, I think, assaults on the rule of law in Poland, in Hungary, in Venezuela at the beginning, in the Philippines, in many places, have begun. The language of law and the language of the rule of law and the institutions of law are not knocked aside. They are emptied of the spirit, the ideal, which should drive them and motivate them. A uh, journalist, a Polish journalist, quoted by Professor Sadurski in his excellent book on the uh, collapse of constitutionalism in, in Poland, uh, Boyarski writes this, everything in Poland with regard to the judiciary seems to happen on the basis of some legal provision or other. And in case any are missing, peace will enact something overnight in a trance. And yet we sense that in fact it's happening by force, contrary to the constitution and to the spirit of the laws, to the principles accepted by civilized people. Now somebody might argue with this, but the provenance of law in the dissembling of what I will say is the ideal of the rule of law is very, very striking at this period in time in a way that it was not apparent in many assaults on the rule of law 
in earlier periods. So if you ask, for example, in Poland, what's wrong uh, when the government party takes over the constitutional tribunal, takes over the National Council of the Judiciary or the procuracy, attacks the Supreme, Supreme Court as an institution, but attacks individual judges, many of them remarkably brave people, like Judge Tulea, uh, the, uh, Judge Yushishin. What's wrong with that? Is it that it's illegal? Well, sometimes it is illegal. The uh, destruction of the Constitutional Court was illegal, but quite often it's not illegal. The law has been complied with, but it has been subverted. The spirit, the ideal, has been subverted in that uh, in that compliance. It's not through destruction, through, uh, as Yeltsin pointed tanks at the parliament, well, nobody has so far pointed tanks at the Supreme Court or the Constitutional Court. It is through what Wojciech Zadulski has called hollowing out, what professor and former uh, constitutional judge Galitsky calls absorption first, and then destruction. Oh, sorry, absorption and then neutralization, pardon me, and then absorption. First, the constitutional court was neutralized, then it was absorbed, and that modus vivendi, or sorry, modus operandi, uh, has been tried in Hungary with many institutions. Now, the reason I keep emphasizing that the legality of measures is not the true test of the rule of law. There are many reasons, but one example we'll have to do because I don't want to speak for too long. Hungary, as we all know, the government has since 2010, for most of its period in, in government, had a constitutional majority. So it could change the constitution again and again in a completely legal way. Poland, the government does not have a constitutional majority, so it has to cheat every now and again. Now, from the point of view of law, it's pretty clear. If you're cheating, you're cheating. You're not doing things legally. From the point of view of the law, it's clear. But from the point of view of the ideal of the rule of law, it is not obvious that Hungary is in a better situation than Poland. Hungary can subvert the rule of law legally in circumstances where the Polish government cheats to do the same job. All right, so I've said so much about what, how not to start, not to start with the institutions, not to start by a list of uh, pieces of law which add up to the rule of law. Now I want to move a little to how I suggest we should start. Now the rule of law is not like a pebble on the road, which you simply can describe. So a pebble looks like this, it has this structure. The rule of law is a normative, it's an ideal. When people say that we want the rule of law, they're not saying we want section 26, 3, 4 of the text. They're saying we want some ideal to be in active in our lives. But what sort of ideal is it? I mean, we have other ideals. Love is an ideal, a nice one. We have some ideals which we, we uh, adhere, or we value because they're goods in themselves. Love is a good thing. I don't think I have to persuade anybody of that. So is a beautiful painting, a beautiful, a good thing. But the rule of law, however handsome a judge uh, might be, is not a beauty in itself. The rule of law, is valuable because it serves to the extent that it serves some worthy ideal. Now, what sort of an ideal? The uh, now American, initially New Zealand legal philosopher, Jeremy Waldron, said that unlike an achievement concept, for example, real love, the rule of law is more of a solution concept. That is, we think of the rule of law as an ideal because we have a problem we want to solve. 
And I want to say, when we ask about the condition of the rule of law in a country, we should ask, is the problem for which the rule of law is a hoped for part of the solution dealt with adequately, never will be dealt with perfectly, or not? Okay, so that means what I'm advocating is we start by asking, well, what is the problem for which rule of law has so often, over millennia, I mean, Aristotle was not the first to say that there were dangers in rule of any individual as distinct from the rule of law. So what is the ideal? In many cultures and in many languages, the negative opposite of the ideal of the rule of law is said to be arbitrary power. Arbitrary power. Often we could say more broadly, abuse of power, but that's so broad, I mean, it doesn't stop. One focus of attention is the way that power is exercised. Power is not of itself evil, we need it. We need uh, quite a lot of power, for example, to keep the peace in troubled times. We may call on power very often to uh, be called on war for just causes. We need power to organize a whole range of things. So power of itself is not, as very often neoliberals have claimed, the enemy. It is arbitrary abuse of power. And what is arbitrary abuse of power? It's very often, it's very common for people to say, well, arbitrary power, we don't like arbitrary power. I'm not going to define it, it's under theorized. Well, I think that's not good enough. And I can't give you a definition, but let me give you three examples which have been very strong and important in rule of law traditions in the world. One way in which power is arbitrary is when somebody or some institution which has significant power over others, over people, can do what they like. That's actually the original Latin term. It's in their arbitrium. They can just do what they like. The common law tradition, or the common law rule of law tradition, which was not always dominant, but popped up every now and again, and particularly in the 20th century, one said, no, I'm not even the king can be above the law. So the problem there that they were identifying is when people or institutions with power can do what they like, it's an unhealthy situation. Another way in which power can be exercised arbitrarily, even if somebody is controlling it, it just, we don't know what it is. Kafka is all about that. It's not clear that he's talking about uncontrolled power. He's talking about bewildering power, about people not knowing where they stand. There are rules, but they don't know what the rules are. Or if they get to the rules, then the rules change. So on this tradition, law is arbitrary, or power, sorry, not law, power is arbitrary when people don't know what the law is or what, what the power is going to do. They don't know what the rules are. The rules are unclear, so unclear that they don't, can't orient themselves. Or they're contradictory. Sometimes yes, sometimes no, and so on. That is a long tradition. That's a very legal philosophers, analytical legal philosophers, emphasize this, and they keep saying that's the rule of law. Well, that's one. Sorry, that violates the rule of law, which it does. A third uh, exercise of power, which is arbitrary, is one which treats people as of no account, treats them like, as Waldron once elsewhere called it, a, de a dilapidated house, a broken down house, or a rabid, diseased dog. We do a lot of things that people don't like with power, sometimes for their own good, sometimes for the good of other people. We put people in jail, we uh, do all sorts of things. But the ideal of the rule of law says, when we do that, we should do it with respect for the people involved. Now, why does that matter? Why does it matter 
that we think we try to construct ways, institutions, norms, because institutions are often very weak unless they're supported, as you can see in the United States. Institutions, long, long tradition. But when the informal norms evaporate or are eroded, then people with power, specifically Trump, but after all, 74 million people voted for him, believe that it's quite okay for them to act in uncontrolled, unpredictable, and disrespectful, unrespectful ways, that is, arbitrarily. So what's wrong with that? After all, in Poland and in Hungary and in other places, leaders get votes and those leaders often say, what we need is a strong hand. What we need is to break what uh, uh, Prezes Kaczynski calls the legal impossibilism, which gets in our way. And some people may believe him. Very briefly, I think, uh, I think there are so many reasons wrong. I, I could spend the rest of the evening and I, I think I will only spend another five minutes talking. Let me mention five values that arbitrary power assaults. Five, therefore, reasons why we should think very highly of whatever arrangements we can have in place which limit the possibilities of uncontrolled, unpredictable, unrespectful exercises of power. One is obvious that, and it's obvious to a lot of judges now in, in Poland and Hungary, and even more dramatically in Turkey or in Venezuela or in Brazil, freedom is assaulted by arbitrary power in these senses, directly assaulted. That being the case, fear is, obvious, is a consequence of the free reign or relatively free reign of arbitrary power. The Republican tradition in political philosophy represented in my country and in the United States by Philip Pettit, but it has many representatives thought has written a great deal of the dangers of arbitrariness to freedom. Not just actual use of power, but circumstances where those people in power and those people who are subject to them know that even if they're not acting arbitrarily at this moment, they're free to. Then another political theorist in, uh, from Riga, in fact, but brought up in First Canada and in United States, Judith Schlar, wrote eloquently and powerfully about the liberalism of fear. Having endured uh, Nazism, having escaped, but knowing a great deal about communism, she insisted that if rule of law and other arrangements did nothing more than liberate us from routine, reasonable, fear, it did good. A third ideal or value that rule of law direct, sorry, that arbitrary power directly assaults and that the rule of law is one range of, the ideal is one, recommends one range of ways to, to uphold is dignity. If you're treated as the object of law, if your interests are not heard, if you can be sent as a Polish prosecutor one day to the next to some provincial town without any hearing, without any judgment, without any opportunity to say this is not fair, or if you as a judge are kept from judging for years or months uh, because of an adverse decision by a prosecutor, then you are being treated as an object, not as a person who has after all, a stake, but also should have a voice in the way you are treated. Fourthly, more indirectly, because it's important, because many authoritarians or many populists like Kaczynski, Orban, and others insist that they are upholding democracy against the rule of law. So-called democracy without the rule of law is an assault on democracy. 
It's an assault on the ideal of democracy, which is a simple thing, the ideal, it's quite hard to reach, which is that the people should have some real ability both to form governments and to form opinions which enable them to choose between governments. If governments take over public television, if they subvert private television and radio and, and other media, if they render people's uh, existence insecure on the basis of their manifestation of their political opinions, if they make it difficult to associate in public, in all these ways, democracy is moving from real to sham. And finally, these are all things that citizens suffer from. They suffer in an indirect way from another aspect of arbitrary power, which is stupidity. Arbitrary power is very often dumb power because it's uninformed, because people don't speak truth to power, and because maybe China, in a terrible way, is going to prove with its new technologies and its that it can be bright and authoritarian at the same time, but it's a rare event. And that the judgment is not in on that. So that's why it matters. So what do you want from institutions and arrangements to serve the ideal of the rule of law? Often, and I think this is a mistaken understanding, people think, and people like Friedrich Hayek have written, that you want to hold power down. It's a negative, that the rule of law is something to uh, limit power, to curb it, to, and of course it does limit. It limits power from wildness. It limits power from arbitrariness. But it also channels power. So the ideal is that governments then will be able, and in fact facilitated, to do what they and only they can do, but prevented from doing what they, but not only they, should not do, which is to treat citizens arbitrarily. So I prefer a language not of limits and curbs, but of moderation, which we want to still practice, and tempering of power. So that power, like tempered steel, is both strong, but more fit for the for purpose than untempered power, wild power, inoperative. Now, I'm going to finish in, in a moment. Why does any of this matter? And to whom does it matter? Very often, and that's why I emphasize the ideal and not the legal mechanics, very often pe people think, even if they think that the rule of law matters, that it is a purely legal ideal, an ideal for lawyers or people who go to court and want to be protected in court. Now, most of us don't go to court. Most of us never see the inside of a court. And what I want to emphasize is that the rule of law is not only, and not ultimately most importantly, a legal ideal, but it is a social ideal and it's a political ideal. It's social because it affects all of us. I, it's, it, it amazes me when I read about Poland, the amnesia of many people who after all, up to 30 years ago, suffered a great deal from arbitrary it was not just judges or lawyers who suffered, it was people in the street, ordinary. So, so society suffers, but also the ideal of the rule of law is not only about law. Many of the uh, enemies of the rule of law are not state actors. They may be, they may have been patronized like uh, some of your leading oil uh, executives, they may have been patronized by state power, but they have other resources. If they act arbitrarily, that's a, a problem for many people. Facebook, if it acts arbitrarily. So the ideal should apply to them because if people or institutions that hold great power can or are likely to or allowed to abuse it, we have a problem. But also, the ideal of the rule of law is social because the law can't support it on its own. As we've seen, there was a lot of good legal borrowing 
in many countries after 89. But the borrowing, for various reasons, which I've tried to think about elsewhere, was weakly institutionalized. It didn't have a, a, large, a large background in some of the countries where it was important. And many of the people who were involved in building legal architecture didn't think much about how much social cement, social attachment, social understanding of what's at stake was important. Uh, perhaps we'll say something more about that in discussion. But finally, this is a political ideal. Very often, particularly in, in when I went to Myanmar uh, with some people also known to you, for example, uh, Wojciech Sadowski and others, and Professor Uitz, when she went in an independent trip. It was common among rule of law promoters, particularly when rule of law seemed to be the only game in town, to think, well, the problem is these guys don't know much about the rule of law. We know lots about it. So we will tell them how to do it, how to build it. We've got this box of tricks, legal devices, how courts should operate, uh, how they should run cases, etc. We'll teach people. And poof, it's all gone. It's gone. Just, it just took uh, a decision by the military government of Myanmar to destroy what many people had a huge investment in, and we can see every day on the streets in Myanmar how deep and how tragic uh, are the results of that fallen investment. Our mistake often was to think that the only reason for difficulty in generating the rule of law, in generating regard for the ideal of the rule of law, was ignorant. There was a, a knowledge problem. But many would-be authoritarians have no knowledge problem at all. They know exactly what they want, and they don't want the rule of law. They know exactly what they want, and they do want to be the vehicles or the directors of arbitrary power, given, as I've claimed, that that is typically likely to be a terrible, terrible thing for the societies in which these people operate, the rule of law ceases, should cease to be thought of as just or primarily a legal thing. It's a social thing. It's a political thing. It's an ideal for us all. And if the fight for the rule of law, which is very courageously being fought by many of the people on the screen, and sitting in my chair, uh, among others, I mean central among others, if that fight fails, and if arbitrary power has the sway that it yearns to have, then uh, that will be another tragedy for people in countries who've known such tragedies before in history. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Krieger. I think you know we can uh, make some acclamation to the uh, to this uh, keynote speech on behalf of all the uh, participants uh, in this uh, webinar. And I would I would like to move to our two commentators. Uh, uh, first, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Alexandra Mercestu, who is a lecturer in law at the West University of uh, Timisoara in Romania. She's also affiliated researcher at the Center for Legal Education and Social Theory at the Wrocław University in Poland. And also she cooperates with NOMOS, which is the Center for International Research on Law, Culture and Power at the Jagiellonian University in Poland. Uh, she received PhD from uh, La Sorbonne in comparative law, and she obtained a lot of prizes, uh, fellowships uh, and recognitions for her um, uh, scholar work. So, Alexandra, if I may, so the floor is yours right now. So, if you could please limit yourself maybe to 10 minutes, uh, then we will have uh, still time for, of course, Dr. Krotoszyński and then for the discussion uh, afterwards. Yes, of course. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bodnar. So, thank you for your kind invitation also to Dr. Philip uh, Chunchi. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be able to discuss uh, today Martin's intervention, especially so since Martin's seminal paper, Law's Tradition, uh, was a dear companion of mine during my doctoral work in comparative law. 
Um, so given this background of mine, I should probably uh, say from the very start that I read the rule of law literature from the perspective of a comparative law scholar who's very much attuned to the importance of context. So I couldn't agree more with Martin's teleological account of the rule of law, which makes uh, room for local practices to achieve uh, one and the same ideal. So this, of course, seriously complicates my task because it's much more easier to establish an exchange with someone with whom you do not agree, or whom you do not understand, or whom you misunderstand. So I'll, I'll, we will see, I'll do my best, and we will see how well I did understand, after all, Marty's argument. There are two uh, implications which I derive from uh, Martin's talk with regards to um, the current uh, so-called populist regimes, uh, which maybe have not been formulated as such by, by Martin, but um, I think uh, they, and I, I, find, I personally find them uh, very important. And Martin then will probably let me know whether uh, this is an abusive interpretation um, by me of his talk. So first of all, I would use Martin's warning against universalizing claims, the fact that we do have varied practices and that institutions change all the time. And I would use the, his focus on, on ends rather than means to stress that what's happening now in, in the region at least is not backsliding, but rather something new. So backsliding, and of course, vocabulary matters a lot. Backsliding suggests continuity, suggests a return to pre-liberal times. Or I think that the sociological account of the rule of law lays emphasis on context and the historical moment in which we are currently living. So if rule of law practices and the lack thereof are to be understood sociologically, that is not merely legally, uh, it follows that the so-called populist um, regimes of, of Hungary or Poland, I think, are to be examined in their specificity. So as different from other populists, uh, and also as different from the authoritarian past and also different from each other. And actually to a certain extent, this is already happening to a satisfactory uh, extent, I think. Uh, so we have many accounts that, uh, well, take into consideration the very details of the changes that are currently uh, taking place both in Hungary and Poland. Uh, now, the second point that I want to make starts from Marty's Martin's de-emphasizing of the legal uh, dimension of the rule of law, which I think is absolutely crucial. It's, it's something that cannot be repeated enough. And given the various attacks on the rule um, of law, I think many scholars today, uh, lawyers but not only, they, they have this tendency to, to the contrary, to re-emphasize the legal dimension, when in fact what we need is precisely the opposite. So the rule of law is not the rule by law. The rule of law is indeed a social and political concept that allows one to uh, see more clearly those situations when evil legality goes in the wrong direction. So hence, I think we should understand that populism is not pure politics, just as liberal democracies are not pure uh, law. So the question to be asked then, I think for me, is uh, to whom uh, is all this important? Who has to understand this? And of course, as Martin suggested, uh, the answer is everyone. So everyone has to understand, the general public. Um, also, but I would like to introduce here a distinction. I think this is something that has to be understood. So this de-emphasizing of the legal dimension by the legal community on the one hand and by the general public. And let me illustrate uh, this point with two examples taken from Romania, which is a country that has not yet fallen prey to the kind of systematic attacks on the rule of law we are witnessing elsewhere in the region but which had a serious problems of its own in recent times, some of which are still in need of um, redress. Um, so if we want to achieve this popular mobilization, if we want people to understand that it's about them, it's not some ab abstruse legal category out there, we might better start by convincing lawyers that the rule of law is not exclusively a legal category. And let me just give you an example. Last year, a court in uh, Timisoara, so my hometown, rejected the application concerning the setup of an NGO because in its founding statute, it was mentioned that it sought to defend human rights, an activity which the judge deemed to be the sole task of accredited lawyers. 
Of course, this absurdity was corrected at the appellate level, and this is, of course, only an anecdotal example. However, I think it very much speaks to the mentality of many judges and lawyers who have been trained to regard the rule of law as a matter of law only. And that's why I think we need to focus more on the role of legal education. Currently, throughout the continental legal tradition, legal knowledge continues to be transmitted in purely technical terms, with the consequence that lawyers end up with a shallow understanding of the immensely complicated relation between law and politics. Uh, too many are ready to portray the two as separate entities, uh, a vision which, in my view, damages both dimensions of the rule of law. The negative one in that lawyers will be unable to see the bad politics that is uh, being done through law, and the positive dimension of the rule of law in that lawyers will be unaware that the various constraints that are placed on them actually can be construed as enabling factors for doing good politics. Uh, or as has been emphasized in the literature by Professor Sadowski, for instance, deep personification risks absolving power holders of responsibility. Now, apart from legal education, it's true that the current political environment, such as it's shaped by the general rhetoric of the various national and supranational officials, is rather unhelpful in building a more nuanced perspective on the rule of law, as is the conventional literature on the rule of law. Uh, to be honest, it's sufficient to watch the news to live under the impression that the rule of law is something that can be easily grasped, quantified, and put into a law. Um, any lawyer who has vaguely heard of the rule of law conditionality regulation adopted by the European Union at the end of 2020 will probably wrongly understand precisely this. Then the Court of Justice itself, uh, while praiseworthy of the European Union, while praiseworthy for placing itself at the forefront of the fight against these authoritarian tendencies, uh, is not of a lot of help either in transmitting the message that there's more to the rule of law than regulation. Of course, a court is a court after all, and it's, it's normal that it deals with regulation. The problem is that the court seems keen on transforming soft instruments into legally binding ones, thus contributing to the legalization of the rule of law. Or this might in turn lead to a disengage disengagement from the part of the public. And this brings me to my second example. So we need to engage the public. Post-1989, um, in Romania tried to build for itself the image of a obedient child who commits to following the rules, which in respectable circles usually meant the prevalence of the legal vocabulary to the detriment of a more political thought. Indeed, large parts of the population came to regard politics as dirty business, whereas law was sanctified. And a few years ago, Romania, as you might know, experienced the largest wave of protests uh, after the revolution. I read in them a moment of a rule of law awakening. I think it was really for the first time when a uh, part of the population understood the rule of law as something that goes beyond the legal arena. For instance, one could observe during the protest signs that read Nazi law was law, apartheid law was law, law is not always justice. Or when the Constitutional Court, for instance, rendered a decision that seemed to conform um, comfort the, the misdeeds of the ruling party, the protesters were ready to contest it in the name of some higher um, ideal or simply on grounds that it did not feel right. So we can see that the rule of law in its social understanding is actually experienced and learned firsthand by the general public. So in this regard, I tend to be uh, rather optimistic. The more the rule of law is attacked, the more the public will have the opportunity to experience it firsthand. Now, it might be that the right kind of impetus in defending the rule of law will not arise unless a thorny issue is at stake, something which directly engages the people and is felt as having a direct impact on their lives. In the case of Romania, this impetus was clearly uh, the fight against corruption. Now I'm asking myself, what would be the impetus in Poland or in Hungary? We've seen that women's right, or rights can be such a strong impetus. But now it seems to me that this inclination to defend the rule of law, uh, in any case through protests or by the general public, comes into play much more firmly when some other benefit flowing from the rule of law is involved and appears in need of defense. So in this sense, we have to accept that the rule of law I'm afraid, uh, at least uh, in the case when we want it to be defended by society at large, it's subservient to other political goals. And as such, I think it is by definition fragile, 
as its restoration will very much depend on how much questions that are directly related to various social and economic outcomes can galvanize the public opinion. Or to put it differently, I think it's highly un unlikely that arbitrary power per se will be heavily contested in the absence of some contestable uh, immediate outcome, not least because in societies like ours, which are hyper legalized, it's very hard even to see that the exercise of power is arbitrary since it usually, it's usually covered in legalistic uh, terms, as, as Martin uh, highlighted. Uh, now, I would like to, to, to come to this last point uh, and maybe to make just a very brief remark about what I feel might be a bit missing from, from Marty's account, namely a reflection on, on conflicts over values in society. And this is a, a reflection that has to do with rule of law in general, that is not in reference with the, the specific Central and Eastern European context. So apparently the tempering of power has nothing to do with, with this, with, with conflicts over values. And liberalism seems to do a pretty good job at, accommodated, uh, uh, at accommodating value pluralism. Yet I believe the third aspect of Malti's criticism of arbitrariness, namely the lack of respect, invites us to reflect more on the topic of conflict. So the idea is that power, the exercise of power, should show respect, should take into account right, uh, the stakeholders' interests, their voices should be heard. Of course, this is all very nice. The problem is that sometimes, even maybe oftentimes, these vo voices will be radically opposed. Moreover, it's not very clear to me what we mean when we say to take into account those voices. Of course, there will be some manifest situation when people's interests are not heard, like uh, the example with the prosecutor who's being muted in another place. So for those situations, the rule of law is certainly good enough as a descriptor. However, I'm, I'm wondering uh, if the rule of law is good enough uh, for borderline situations. For instance, does it mean to take into account, does it mean to simply consider? Well, if so, it seems that we fall back on some kind of procedural rule of law, formal rule of law, that can be quite dangerous in the sense in which, of course, illiberal democracies could very easily pass that test, right? And if we consider that to take into account means to actually transport, transpose in practice the various conflicting demands, well, we manifestly and in a, in a deadlock. So I think there are some inherent limits to the idea that power should always be respectful of the, the stakeholders. Yes, of course, it's an ideal. We should strive uh, to accomplish this, to, 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 to be there. The problem is, is, is it really possible? So basically here, I'm taking issue a bit with this third part, which seems to me because unpredictable. So we do not want power to be unpredictable. We do not want it to be controlled. I think these are pretty easy to grasp. But when it comes to the respect of the interest, this is, I think it's much more um, complicated. And uh, let me leave you with this, with this final um, a thought, hopefully a challenging one, just because the rule of law is abused in some countries, it doesn't mean that we have to ascribe to it powers that it does not actually have, not even in regimes which are indeed much more respectful of it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Alexandra, for this wonderful uh, comment and for uh, a little bit of challenging of uh, Professor Krieger. Uh, so after your, uh, yours and Dr. Kotoszynski's comment, I will give a uh, floor to Professor Krieger just for five minutes, uh, and then we'll go to the, uh, to the discussion. So uh, if anybody would like to, uh, to ask a question, please uh, raise your hand. So if you see on the top, uh, in the top you have reactions, and then you can basically choose not only that you like this webinar, but also that, for example, you may uh, uh, you may raise your hand and I, I will do my best to give you the floor. Or you can also send me a direct message via the chat and then I will know who is basically ready to, uh, to, take, a, uh, to take a floor and maybe we'll be able to accommodate a couple of uh, questions. So right now I would like to give a floor to Dr. Michał Krotoszyński, who is assistant professor at the Department of Fear and Philosophy of Law at the Faculty of Law and Administration at the University of Adam Mickiewicz in Poznań. Uh, so he's dealing mostly in his research with uh, transitional justice, legal values, and legal interpretation. He's also a practicing lawyer with a specialization with healthcare, healthcare law and communications law. 
So, Dr. Krotoszynski, please, floor is yours. Michał, we can hear you. Michał. Oh. Once again, we can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, it's okay now. Okay, sorry. Uh, so thank you. And uh, once again, uh, I would like to thank both the organizers for the kind invitation and Professor Krieger for an inspiring lecture. Uh, I must say I feel both humbled and honored to be given an opportunity to comment on his work. Uh, I'm not a legal sociologist. I'm not a rule of law philosopher. I'm more of a lawyer and a legal theorist. So in my comment, I would like to highlight some moments in Professor Krieger's speech and in his work in general, uh, which seem to me to be especially important today. Uh, and based on that, uh, maybe even ask a question or two about the rule of law in general. So uh, one of the reasons why I think this uh, teleological approach that Professor Krieger uses can be useful is that it can help us to deal with the kind of dishonest legal argumentation that the regimes may use to justify their actions nowadays. So uh, many of us here in Poland disbelieve government claims that the 2015 statute, which threatened to paralyze independent constitutional court, were aimed at fostering its proper functioning. Today, we also recognize as false the government claims that, for example, a new institution which undermines judicial independence is simply an import from a standard um, rule of law instrument found in one or two European countries. But well, how exactly can we prove uh, that these justifications are dishonest? How can we show that an institution is hollow or that the statute was enacted in bad faith in order to create a social problem instead of addressing it. So uh, researchers such as Wojciech Ciszewski and Marek Smolak have employed John Rawls' idea of public reason and one of its components, the principle of sincerity. Uh, according to Ciszewski, for example, an action is deemed sincere if one can rationally come to the conclusion that the considerations that have been officially indicated as its justification and not some other reasons are the best explanation for making this decision. This means, for example, that in normal circumstances, the action should lead to the consequences publicly offered as its explanation and that the decision makers do not refrain from other actions that the alleged motives should also trigger. But I believe that Professor Krieger's theory offers a compelling alternative and a test which is even easier to carry out. Uh, we no longer need to concentrate on specific legal institutions uh, as this would be focusing on the rule of law anatomy instead of its goals. Thus, uh, we may concentrate on bigger questions. First, uh, how will the change affect the distribution of power among state institutions? And second, does the change proposed by the government increase or decrease the level of arbitrary power the government, the government enjoys. So from this point of view, uh, paralyzing or court packing a constitutional court and undermining the independence of judiciary, the bodies which purpose, one of the purposes is to limit the power of government, are one of the most obvious examples of, power, of simple power grabs. And this is the first thing. Uh, second, I think that the approach proposed by Professor Krieger can also help us to conceptualize some ways in which arbitrary power interacts with other features of authoritarian legislation. So here I will concentrate, I want to concentrate on one such connection, and this is the relation between discretionary government power and collective responsibility. So let me start with two Polish examples. Uh, one comes from the 2017 Supreme Court Act. One of its provisions forced the retirement of all judges over 65 years of age, unless the motion for a prolonged service was granted by the president. 
Uh, well, in the end, the purge was not implemented due to the EU Court of Justice order, but it is important to notice what was planned. The government opted for a collective responsibility for a purge based on solely on age, uh, well, with little possibility of exception. And second example, well, it comes directly from the field of transitional justice. In 2016, the Polish government amended the Uniformed Services Pension Act. And uh, one of the reasons why the law still is highly problematic is that it lowered the pensions received by the former officers and employees of uh, communist secret services to an average Polish pension. And the law did that even if a person served in communist agencies for a short time, did not participate in the suppression of anti-communist opposition, and later faithfully served in democratic Poland as well. Well, the circumstances I now describe could only be a basis for a decision of the Minister of Internal Affairs to exclude such a person from the scope of the law. But this option was very rarely used up to date. So uh, the reduction of pension also does not involve people who can prove that they secretly uh, supported opposition movements. But of course, to prove this more than 30 years after the transition can, can be extremely uh, difficult from, from a procedural point of view. So, and, and uh, if no exception applies, the reduction also affects pensions for the families of the deceased one. Uh, so, uh, apart from the two unlikely exceptions noted above, the law is based on collective responsibility uh, as it applies to former communist security service employees and their families, regardless of the length and character of their service. When, and I think what the, these two examples show us is um, that the turn towards collective responsibility can also mean more arbitrary power. Uh, at first, this may look like a paradox. After all, isn't individual responsibility connected with judicial power? And shouldn't collective responsibility mean that there is no room for discretion? Uh, but this line of thinking soon proves wrong. Uh, first, the power that the courts have in assessing individual cases is not, in normal cases, an arbitrary power. The courts are bound by legal regulations, including rule of law requirements, and the right to free trial means that those who are judged are also empowered to present, to present their case before an independent court. Thus, an individual assessment of a case may be seen as something that a citizen is entitled to. And on the other hand, collective responsibility means that those who are affected by it often have no case to present before the court. Uh, as collective responsibility can be deemed unjust even by authoritarian standards, the government may decide to introduce exceptions as it was in the case of the two examples I described before. Yet in these cases, the people affected had to motion not the courts, by the but the president and the minister of internal affairs. So those bodies had a full discretion on whether to grant such an appeal. Uh, and I believe that this move towards collective responsibility can be seen as a change from a system where citizen bear rights that can be restrict, restricted only due to the individual wrongdoing and by independent courts, and towards a system where people are more objects of power, like Professor Krieger said, to whom the government may or may not grant a favor of a more individual approach. And I wonder whether Professor Krieger would agree with such a description. Uh, and to finish up, because I'm, I'm getting closer to, to the end of my time, uh, one general remark. Uh, I think there is yet another dimension to the rule of law of crisis, which I think deserves special mention, and this is the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, because this is a time when the discretion on the, on, the, on the side of the government grew even stronger. I will just give one example from Poland, and this is uh, the... Uh, the appearance of a type of administrative decisions in Poland, which even if they can be appealed, are directly enforceable from the moment they were announced, can initially, initially at least, have, an, have only an oral form and do not need any kind of justification. Uh, so uh, even though I am not claiming that the intentions of the government while enacting this legislation must have been sinister, 
because uh, some may argue that in times of the emergency, the government has to act quickly and needs more discretionary power. What I'm afraid of is that I think there is a risk that these extraordinary tools introduced in times of emergency can be normalized and that the exception will become the rule. Uh, this happened in the past. In his book, The Impossible Machine, Adam Zitzer writes about the relation between the rule of law in the views of uh, Albert Dicey and the Indemnity Act. And he knows that while on the English soil, the Indemnity Acts were a rare exception from the rule of law, in the colonies, they were used routinely. So the exception became the rule. So I wonder, is there a risk that these emergency regulations will have a lasting effect and change, at least for a foreseeable future, the amount of arbitrary power that is accepted even in the countries dedicated to the rule of law, like Australia, for example? Well, I don't know to the answer to this question myself. So naturally, I look towards Professor Krieger's and wonder whether he has one. Thank you very much. And once again, it was a privilege to speak here. Uh, Dr. Kotoszynski, Michał, if I may, so thank you very much for, uh, for your uh, comment uh, and also for uh, adding additional perspective to our discussion on this ideal of the rule of law uh, and its relevance in Central and Eastern Europe. Now I would like to give the floor to Professor Krieger just to shortly answer uh, those uh, issues and questions made by our commentators. And later on, we'll go into the discussion. I have already three persons on my list. So first will be Professor Renata Uitz, then Professor Mirosław Wyszykowski, and then Dr. Barbara, Grobows Barbara Grobowska-Moros. Uh, uh, so, so right now, Professor Krygi. Uh, Martin, we cannot hear you. My usual strategy in circles like this is to speak very fast. But since there are people from many places of the world, I can't use that. And I'll just use the five minute excuse. If I find any questions too hard to answer, I'll leave them to the end. But I'll start with an issue or with a term that both of these excellent discussions used. It's a term that I didn't mention in my talk, but I've used very often. I just, another way of saying what I have been saying is a distinction I make between approaching the rule of law teleologically, that is through, from the Greek telos or point, starting with the point of the rule of law, rather than starting by trying to lift what I call the anatomy, this feature of the legal system. Why? For all the reasons I mentioned, for those that have been mentioned here too, uh, if we hold on to the point, if it's important enough, we will find many circumstances where what worked in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, doesn't work as well in Tbilisi, Georgia, and so on. We can expand the reasons for that. Uh, it does mean that if you want to generate the rule of law, I don't like the word build, you have to give much more attention to context, which is traditions, which is values, which is an attitude to power, to the state and to law in the country where you're hoping to generate it, then is commonly thought about or has been commonly thought about by legal promoters of the rule of law. They have the anatomy, they have the box of tricks and they take them somewhere. And very often we are deeply disappointed uh, as we, ha we have reason to be. But I'm not saying it's easy to take context into account. I'm not even saying it has to be successful, but I think you can't possibly be successful in generating uh, adherence to the ideal of the rule of law unless you take very seriously what is going on in the particular society, what are ways there of dealing things, rather than export from capital of some rich, usually rich, uh, Western country a certain box of tricks. So we're in agreement completely on that. I'm also in agreement on Alexandra's uh, suspicion of the term backsliding. And in uh, uh, Festschrift to Wojciech Sadurski, I take issue with his use of that term for two reasons at least. One, the one that you mentioned, a lot of new things are happening. We're not just going back. Secondly, uh, there is a lot of creative energy 
here. It's not as though, I mean, one could say, if I used to be beautiful, now I'm not so beautiful, I've slid backwards. It's all me. But the fact is, legal uh, systems and the rule of law in countries, many of the countries I mentioned, are not simply a matter of age or dissolution or something. They are a matter of active subversion. Of course, that subversion can't take the same, have the same effects everywhere, but it exists. Uh, and it has, backsliding seems to be too passive a term to account for that. Uh, I, I welcome the support of both commentators for my sociologizing of the rule of law. Uh, that is my sense that if you want to think seriously about how the value might be attained, sustained, and approached, then you have to think a lot about things other than law. And also, things less spectacular in law than often we focus on. A great deal of rule of law discussion focuses on constitutional court. Easy to do, superior courts, they write long judgments, usually professors are writing them, they're translated into English. But a lot of subversion, a lot of arbitrary power, as is too often, too rarely noticed, happens in the actions of administrators or local uh, officials or not officials, local gangsters or mafias or, uh, or uh, clans or whatever. Uh, and the, the, we miss these sometimes huge sources of arbitrary power if our focus is domestic, high, usually appellate courts. A great deal of the, at least, analytical literature on the rule of law takes our place nowhere outside the, high, the highest courts of a country. Not many people go to those courts, but a lot of people get screwed around all over the place where power is arbitrary. And we should take that seriously if the ideal is something that matters to us. Uh, I think the issue of co two points, uh, the rule of law is, is never an exclusive value. That is, it's not the only game in town. We might have to seriously think about compromising it in certain circumstances and maybe to come to this issue of pandemic in those circumstances, notwithstanding, because we have other things that are of value and they may clash. I was in Europe when uh, my country de de declared lockdown. I got back too late uh, and I had to go on to a two-week quarantine. And I wrote a, an, S, uh, an article, an op-ed article, uh, warning of the sorts of dangers which Michal has pointed to rightly. I think they're really important dangers. The danger of what I call legal uh, bleeding. So uh, anti-terrorist legislation, which becomes, it bleeds, it seeps into criminal law, ordinary criminal law. But I, I sent it to two newspapers, they weren't interested. And I'm relieved about that because at least in my country, so far the things have done so much better than I understood. And I still haven't got an answer to why. Uh, this danger has not yet eventuated, and the other danger which has eventuated has been adequately dealt with. Another point is that I agree with Alexandra that uh, it's, it's very likely that it's only when, as an older, no longer with us, Polish sociologist used to say, Adam Podgorewski, used to say people are most conscious of valuable rights when those rights are crippled. And when they're not crippled or in danger, they're easy to take for, for granted. What I find when I look in Poland and Hungary is how quickly they can be taken to granted, even in societies where not so long ago they were crippled. I don't think the memory of crippledom seems to be a terribly long one, and I worry about that. Uh, and I think you're right that Probably, large interest in the rule of law will never be for its own sake, but as it's connected with other important values. On the other hand, I've wanted, I haven't emphasized it enough, to stick with a very modest conception of the rule of law, modest but precious. So my, the rule of law, as I understand it, is not 
as it is for many thick theories of the rule of law, all the values that you'd want, justice, human rights, etc. I want to say those things are important. People, the rule of law is not more important, though it might be instrumental than they are. But the way that power is exercised is a value of itself. And I, I want to stress that, but I agree with you. Maybe no one will be listening. My experience in life. Uh, on conflict of values, I think that, again, I think that is certainly fundamental. Fundamental. Uh, and I would only approach it this way. Uh, a mentor of mine, a great sociologist, Philip Silver, used to talk of approaching certain values at two levels. First of all, establish conditions, basic conditions of survival and existence. But don't stop with those then aim for flourishing. Now, I think at the lower level, we can easily see unrespectful actions of people of power. They're all over the place and they're horrible. And we should try uh, to eliminate them to the extent we can. Not because that's the pinnacle of our hopes, but because it's important. Uh, the Israeli philosopher Abishai Margalit published a wondrous book called The Decent Society. And The Decent Society for him was one where institutions did not humiliate people. Now that's not enough. And he knew it was not enough. He said, why have I defined this virtue negatively? Because the negative violations are urgent and visible, and we should deal with them, not because that's the story, but because that has to be the beginning of the story. Uh, I've left, I'm sure, a lot out. But my excuse is I didn't know how to answer it in the time. Uh, thank you, Martin. Thank you uh, very much for uh, those answers. <clears throat> now I would like to collect a couple of uh, questions and then to give you a chance to answer them. Uh, we have all together uh, uh, five persons that are going to ask a question. First, as I said, Professor Renata Uitz, then Professor Wyszykowski, then Dr. Barbara Grabowska uh, Moros, then Professor Dimitri Koczenow from Budapest, and then Mrs. Anna Piekarska. So that is like, and I think you know this. So if you can, please, Martin, take your notebook and just make some notes with questions, then it will, I think it will be easier for uh, to basically get, uh, get the grip uh, on all of those questions. So now I would like to ask uh, Renata, who is, I don't know where is Renata right now, but maybe she will share with us this uh, information, because as I understand, we represent right now the whole World starting for sure from Poland to Australia. So, Professor Weeds, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Bodnar, uh, and and welcome uh, your your invitation to see the, the global representation. I'm in in London at the moment on 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 sabbatical, but representing CEU Vienna. So, uh, the question to Martin. Uh, and this is a, a long ongoing conversation if we and this is about talk rule of law as an ideal and the question is really inspired by recent responses of both the polish and the hungarian government to when the rule of law as an ideal is mobilized against them because they tend to refer to higher ideals so their game is pitching higher ideals whether it's constitutional identity, Christianity, you, you pick, but this, this will be a battle of, of ideals and I'm wondering how, how will uh, the rule of law come out better. Uh, then there are those regimes who couldn't care less about those five values which you listed, freedom, dignity, equality, what have you. Uh, China is the obvious example where you have plenty of rule and plenty of law, but not rule of law. And what I'd love you to, 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 to speak on to, if, if you manage, is of course Burma, because in Burma the problem is not that Myanmar, the problem is not so much that they couldn't care about the ideal, the problem is that they have a very particular understanding of both rule and law and they add to the local understanding plenty of violence that is military force. And if you follow Nick Cheeseman, uh, then what is happening at the moment is essentially we are going back to the pre-2008 understanding uh, of, of what was understood locally 
as as rule of law and translated in, into English as, as rule of law. So I'd like you to work a little bit with the ideal for, for everyone's benefit. Thank you very much, Professor Uit. Uh, best greetings from Warsaw to London. And now uh, I think uh, we should turn to Professor Wyszykowski, who I suppose is Warsaw based. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I'm in Warsaw. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Martin, for your uh, excellent introduction. Uh, and uh, as we, uh, the most of us, as we remember 2015, 2016, we claim it is a crisis of rule of law. And it was labeled. Uh, and it was correct. But in Poland, starting from 2015, there is war against constitution performed by constitutional authority, including the first victim of this war, means uh, Constitutional Tribunal of Poland, being now proud participant in distortion of the constitutional state. And uh, the, my question is indeed, based on your observations, knowledge, and uh, a variety of cases, what is the beginning of the end of the ideal of the rule of law? And what is the triggering element of this beginning of the end of rule of law? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Wyszykowski, for question. Now I would like to turn to Dr. Uh, Grabowska uh, Moros, who I don't know where is she right now, but maybe she will share with us this information. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Adam. I'm in my living room in Amsterdam. Um, I want to ask about the rule of law conditionality, which was already mentioned. Um, today, around, I think, 6.50, I woke up and turned on Twitter. It's a bad, bad habit that it happened. And I saw Laurent Pesch post, and he, he quoted analysis of Anna Wojcik from Oko Press, and he, and he wrote, authoritarian governments of Poland and Hungary are asking ECJ to annul regulation on the conditionality, arguing that the expression rule of law is not defined in EU law, cannot be defined in EU law. And my question to, uh, to Professor Krieger would be, what does it give yeah. What kind of chance that it give to the Court of Justice right now? They are going to hear the case from Poland and from Hungary. Um, how the Court of Justice, how should the court answer that question? How rule of law should be defined using this particular case? Because in the, in the previous case, we, we, we have plenty of um, 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 rulings saying what are the elements of the rule of law, very formalistic approach. We have, um, we have a case law based on ACGP, arguing that uh, you know, the, the, the judicial access to judicial remedy under Article 19 of TU is expression of the rule of law. It was basically used for the purpose of uh, judicial independence cases. And now we, I think we have a, a huge opportunity in the court, opportunity to define the rule of law for the purpose, not only for the member states, but also for the EU in, in general. So how do you think how, how the court should, um, should do that job? Thank you. Great, fantastic. Uh, thank you very much. So we have uh, London, Warsaw, Amsterdam, next to Sydney and, uh, and Warsaw and other locations. Uh, so now I would like to ask Professor Dimitri Kochenov, who is for sure in Budapest. I'm, in, I'm on sabbatical in Oxford, but in fact, I'm in Budapest. Oh, so right. I, represent, oh, right. I represent CU Budapest. And my, and my question is probably more, uh, uh, in, it's going in a wild direction. Like you, you started with the, 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 the fact that history doesn't have this binary vision anymore. But, uh, but is this really true if we read the critiques of the standard critiques of constitutionalism? Like uh, James Tully's strange, uh, Tully's strange multiplicity work, and 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 how they connect to the idea, uh, to the question whether law actually can uh, uh, channel ideals, and to and to and to to what kind of degree these ideals will be generally accepted, and in this sense, uh, I think if we if we do take the, the take the idea of the law 
as, uh, as, as something that channels ideas as, a, as opposed to manages societies uh, to, to push down those with whom the law disagrees, then can the law be uh, precisely the, the wrong starting point for, uh, for organizing, uh, the, organizing our life Around the, around the three ideals, uh, fighting un uncontested, fighting unpredictable, and fighting unrespe un unrespectful power uh, that, that you outlined. And here I come to, I come to Lenin. If, if we believe that law is really about oppressing at least some people in society, then law is, is the wrong vehicle for the ideal that would, that would preach inclusion. And of course, uh, of course, plenty of examples can be given uh, that these this ideals change, but someone is necessarily excluded and someone is necessarily uh, upset and someone necessarily loses in front of the courts, no matter what. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Dimitri. Uh, greetings to UK then. Uh, and now I would like to ask uh, Mrs. Anna Pikarska to take a floor. Thank you very much for the most illuminating and engaging webinar and also for the possibility to speak. I'm a doctoral researcher with the Department of Philosophy at uh, Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznań. So hello from Poznań. Um, and as philosophers are want to do, I want to ask a deceptively easy question or maybe it's just a matter of clarification. I'd like to know what exactly do you understand by power? Because you ascribe it uh, both to uh, state and non-state agents. And as a reversal of this question or a follow-up to this question, uh, is there a state, do you allow theoretically the state of absolute powerlessness or subjection uh, as the other side of domination or arb arbitrary power in its extreme? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mrs. Pikarska, and greetings to Poznań then. And I have just last question um, by Mrs. Jeva Timermane, uh, and I will read this question, which is quite complex. I will try to read it slowly. Any cross-border harmonization of norms is related to changes in the legal norms of the other country. If it is a long period of time, there is a flood of norms in which people cannot see true justice. Simple and user-friendly procedures for applying substantive rules are today's challenge. By your opinion, what are solutions for creating a similar understanding of justice? So that is the question by Mrs. Eva Timmermann. So, uh, Professor Krieger, uh, Martin, the floor is yours. So, you know, you have some time to answer all those uh, pending uh, uh, questions. Uh, and then after you will get to the conclusion of a, a seminar. Well, thank you, thank you. Uh, and and Martin, time... just one thing, uh, one technical thing. If you could just con be concentrated in one, like in the middle and speak like in the middle, then basically will not lose your voice when you are just okay. moving because from time to time we are losing you. Okay. okay. Uh, I will try to answer these questions, but some draw on what is not with false or real modesty, my ignorance. I'm not a European lawyer. I'm hardly a lawyer at all. I once upon a time, but I've lived a long life. I was a lawyer, uh, but my attitude to many things is to think about law, but not as a lawyer anymore. And that's really where I've come to be the rule of law. Partly that's temperamental. But partly it, it does flow from things that I thought were missed and from a kind of, I think, quasi sociological sensibility that I discovered in myself. I wasn't planning it that way. And it didn't go on. It didn't go together with a great sociological sophistication. But I approach many of the sorts of issues that lawyers will instinctively approach from within the law. Uh, as questions about the law to which the law is only part and a variable part of the answer. Well, uh, if, but now, having tried to cover myself with a few excuses, I should say something about the questions that were asked. Renata's question were well, two questions. Uh, to the extent that you can pretend that 
the sorts of arguments that Renata mentioned of Poland and Hungary, they serve higher ideals than the rule of law. To the extent that they should be treated as sincere, uh, which I think is a questionable one, then my sincere answer is close, though they wouldn't thank me, I think, for the parallel or the analogy, to a similar argument which was current among Marxists. That is, Marxists didn't talk much about the rule of law, partly because they didn't think it did anything of what it preached in real societies, and partly because they thought it wouldn't be needed after emancipation. And my uh, view of that was similar to a distinction that Andrzej Walitsky, the great Polish historian of Polish but also Russian thought, made in his book on Marx. He said Marx had a complex vision of freedom. On the one hand, uh, it was his goal, the emancipation of the human species. On the other hand, it didn't, he had no interest in the protections of individuals, which is a long tradition of thinking about freedom. And even if you were to take the protestations of Poland and Hungary in the courts about higher ideals, seriously, my rule of law inspired demand is what about breaks? That's a very simple, modest, uninteresting demand. We, and particularly people in your part of the world, have seen what comes of idealists who are devoted, some of them particularly in the earlier years, um, sincerely, to ideals so important to them that the question of having breaks or having remedies when things go wrong was not for them a serious issue. It was not a, an exciting issue. It was not a value issue. And I think that it's a matter of sensibility. People who are romantic, Trotsky was an example. Trotsky was a very great figure, thinker, actor, and murderer. And he was not a murderer just because, because he liked murdering. He was not a routine murderer, the way the generals in Myanmar are. He was an ideologically motivated murderer. I'm not comparing this go these governments with that, but I am saying that there is a kind of blindness to the point that many people committed to the ideal of the rule of law are taken seriously. That however, and coming back to Alexandra's question, however important flourishing in terms of contested values of various sorts is, breaks are important. And that's where I come in to the rule of law. Uh, I didn't come in to the rule of law, by the way, because I was a lawyer, because as I've confessed, I'm hardly that, but because of my family history, which is common to the history of many people on the screen, which is that our parents and grandparents suffered uh, from two waves of untempered power, and they suffered dearly. I, mine were ultimately lucky, and so was I, that they escaped, and I was born in a country which didn't have that problem, but it was, in my imagination, a central problem of politics and of law, and that's why it seems to me so important. So even if I were to take the protestations about higher ideals seriously, which I don't really, uh, I would say uh, breaks are important. As for China and Burma, China is hugely interesting because the Chinese government spends an enormous amount of attention, money, reflection on law. It has no interest in the rule of law, it, except it does actually in certain branches have an interest in predictability, for example, in control of inferior powers. It has very little interest in pretty much nothing to respect. And all of these are even areas of respect are within the frame of Ernst Frankel's uh, notion of a dual state, one which combines at once a prerogative sphere where the regime can ultimately do what they like, and a normative sphere in certain defined but also changeable areas 
rules are useful. So I would say in rule of law terms, it's nowhere, but in legal terms, it's phenomenally interesting. Burma, one of the interesting things, oh, sorry, it's not very interesting. <laughs> Uh, one thing that's happening now is that the Burmese regime is making a great pretense of being of doing what they're doing legally. It is a pretense in everybody's view. But uh, Renata mentioned a, a colleague and friend of mine and a wonderful book, Nick Cheeseman's book. Um, uh, Sorry, I have it somewhere in the Anyway, these words are figure in it. Um, law and order, something like that. How Myanmar's courts uh, destroyed the rule of law. I think I put it more dramatically than he did. He was a, an ethnographer after a lot of experience, 10 years on, on borders between Burma and Thailand who decided to write his doctorate on something which he had not planned when he started. He was interested in the play of law in Burma. And he went to a whole range of courts and he sees, he's reading petitions by people and he's also reading judgments. And they're all talking of rule of law. In Burmese, there are two terms for rule of law. One is roughly the same as the English term, rule of law. The other one is the one that the generals used to gesture to rhetorically to this, but in a different way. It's law doesn't figure in the, in the term. It says tranquility, peace and tranquility. And his argument is, was that the regime which seemed to end in 2010 to 15 uh, was one which was devoted to what he calls law and order, that is the subjection of people to a, a system of tranquility. Law was useful for them, but somebody mentioned government by law. That's the way it was used. Whereas the petitions he saw, coming back to Alexandra's question, how do people get interested? Again and again, he saw people who didn't just feel that they were being screwed. They felt outraged that they are not being treated according to some conception that they had of the rule of law. Uh, it's not, I, I think that law is so instrumentally fashioned by the generals that there is no way, no one way in which it can restrain them at present from doing whatever they like, except for rhetoric. And the rhetoric, rather transparent, is that they're doing it to save the Constitution, and they're doing it under the Constitution, and they're doing it in honor, or at least faithful, to laws, which ultimately can possibly be true, because they're writing a lot of laws as we speak, and they'll give themselves laws for every purpose. Anyway, uh, what's the beginning and the end of the rule of law? Well, I refer back to Alexandra's point and Michal's point that on my view, there is no point. So, sorry, there is no single point. The way the rule of law had some possibilities in Burma in the last 10 years was ended, at least for the time being, and probably for a long time, has very little analogy with the encroachment that you find rightly so offensive as a distinguished lawyer yourself, where the legal tools are the main weapons being used by people who are in no way motivated. I wrote this recently in an article I hope you'll see. No way motivated by the spirit of constitutionalism, but by what I've called the spirit of domination. It's the law that they use. They know the arguments. Once, actually, when I was at a meeting in, with lawyers in Burma, one of them said, talking about the constitution, which was drafted by the generals, one of our problems is that they have all the best lawyers. Well, I don't think in Poland they have the best lawyers, but presumably they have some good lawyers. And they use the law to destroy the law and to destroy the spirit of what I've called the rule of law. But if you were to ask me what was the point 
at which the rule of law, the beginning of the end, happened in in Poland. I would be guessing, but I think that the first night of the appointment of the Dublin might be that. But it would be only a guess, and it wouldn't be generalizable because other countries are more than uh, Barbara asks about protests or objections by Poland and Hungary to being held to rule of law conditionality. And here I'm taken into really a space that I know nothing about, but in a primitive extra legal way, uh, I always was amused by the terms of Article 4 of the Copenhagen Agreement, which required that countries show stability of the rule of law and other things. Uh, and I can't remember the rest of the sentence, but the way that stability was shown was that they signed 80,000 pages of the Aki. That's a strange way to show stability of institutions. Everything that I believe about the need for institutionalization, the sociological underpinnings, which are, none of these could have been shown then. And what we find in subsequent years that in many places and in many respects, they were weak. But as for a definition of the rule of law, I can't, I, if a lawyer can give it good for, I've never seen one which satisfies me because I'm not, mine is a political understanding and a, a sort of ideal understanding that um, the rule of law comes to be a means for a valuable end. A means which is variable in, or at least the law, the role of law in seeking that in is variable. Uh, there's something that I, I sometimes worry that I over sociologize my understanding of the rule of law because, particularly looking at people who are trying to generate it and claiming to build it, I keep thinking what they're missing. How do you think that building a courthouse in Afghanistan is going to promote the rule of law? Any other things. But there's an opposite lesson which has made me feel a bit more humble. When the bad guys uh, in a number of modern authoritarian populist leaning states have a strategy, they take the law very seriously because their strategy is to go after pivotal legal institutions. Not only they go after the press, they go, but that's these guys must know something. And I think there is a very different logic to the logic of building and the logic of destruction. Destruction can be much more single focused uh, or, or spread. Building has to be uh, uh, multi-sourced. Dimitri, again, I mean, I've just finished today a piece on my mentor, Philip Silver. And the piece is called An Ecumenical Sensibility and partly there are many reasons for that. He was an ecumenical as a sociologist. He wanted to involve philosophy and other things. But another aspect of it was something he learned from the philosopher John Dewey, a distaste for what he called pernicious dualisms, either or. Law is either a, victor, is a vehicle of ideals or it's a source of oppression. We know that it's both. Again and again, it's been both. Sometimes it's only been one, and very often that one, because it's so associated with power, is the one you were speaking about. But we also know that many values in large societies depend on legal support, and in some countries they get them. So I don't think, uh, I certainly don't think there is any reason to idealize law in general or to idealize legality given that so many people use law for pernicious goals. But if, even if you treat it purely instrumentally, and I treat it more, or I think of it more instrumentally than, for example, Mirek, who was a, a champion and, 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 and uh, his whole life has been within, maybe not his whole life, but a lot, part of his life has been building, defending, commenting, participating in the law. I suspect 
that his idea of the possibilities and the ideals for law are richer than mine. But I wouldn't go the other direction either. I wouldn't say, which was a standard Marxist objection. I've written again and again, because I like these 11 pages so much, on the 11 pages in E.P. Thompson's conclusion of his book, Whigs and Hunters, where the book shows the um, oppressive and exploitative use of law throughout the whole book. But then he speaks at the end of the ideal of the rule of law in my language as a cultural achievement of universal significance. Well, that's probably Australians don't talk big, so I, maybe I wouldn't say that, but it's, it's up there, I think. It's up there. So, uh, Martin, can we get to the like concluding answers? Yes, this is the last one. Uh, power. And I, I can be brief because it's the central question to which I have no satisfactory answer. And I've been embarrassed by your question before. Don't think you're original. Because I don't, uh, in a very primitive sociological sense, uh, people and institutions, disparities of power are everywhere. Like Foucault, I don't think power is something that some people have and other people don't. It's a matter of disparities in relationship and what people with more power in this relationship can do to others. I don't believe there is ever absolute powerlessness or absolute power. It's a matter of shifting, changing relationships. Sometimes it's so dramatic that you can't, you can easily slip into that language. Uh, and I'll, I think I'll have to leave it at that. Uh, thank you, Professor Krieger, for this uh, great additional uh, elaboration on your uh, concepts and understanding of the uh, of the rule of law. Uh, now I would like to uh, give the floor to Dr. Filip Cewinczyk uh, from the SWPS Universities who helped me in organizing this uh, event. Filip? Uh, okay, thank you, Professor. Thank you for all participants. Um, I'm looking forward. Uh, what the, uh, this meeting was very important for me, still is very important for me because I see here my colleagues, I see my students, I see my, my professors as Martin. I see also my reviewers of my PhD as Professor Wyszykowski and Professor Stempin. But I also see uh, that we are able, even in, the, in this or during these or extraordinary circumstances, we are able to be still a community of knowledge, univer community, typical university, so international community of knowledge. And it is extremely important. And I'm looking forward for all to see all of you during our next meeting, Spring with Rule of Law in Central and Eastern Europe. And I would like also particularly to say thank you, apart from speakers, from Kinos, from Martin, Alexandra, Michal, for, for, uh, I, I would like also thank you for people who ask questions. They've been typing on chat, but I also would like to ask uh, to, I, I would like to say thank you for people who supported us in uh, organizing this event for Eva Ratsenaya from RGSL, for all RGSL team marketing, for our marketing, uh, Mrs. Zofia Orly, for, uh, uh, for Oscar from IT. So um, to the point, uh, we are, I see thanks to this meeting that universities still exist, even in the internet, but we still the community of knowledge, we are still a community of academics. Thank you very much from my side, for all of you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. When I was mentioning all those cities we are in, uh, I forgot to mention Riga, Riga, which is our great partner. And I would like to ask Director Yeva Ratsenaya to, to take a uh, floor with some final remarks on the on behalf of the RGSL. Yeah, thank you, Adam. And uh, well, uh, thank you very much for participants and very good regards from Riga as well. And uh, uh, on behalf of Riga Graduate School of Law, RGSL, I would like really to thank Professor Krieger for agreeing. And this was a a great idea which actually developed very fast and, and very actively and it's thanks also to internet possibilities we could connect a lot of interesting uh, people also from Riga and everywhere else and uh, I would like to uh, say and invite all the today's participants for the next three events we are planning uh, event on each uh, month 
Uh, we cannot uh, release yet the participants for the next ones, but the, the promise stays that we will be touching upon the very, very important issues for, uh, in regard to our societies. And I think the, the next events will be as interesting as, as this, as, uh, as today. Well, thank you very much for this. I'm really, really great that we managed to do it, this event in a very fast way. And I think we will be as efficient and as interesting in the future as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Yeva, for uh, for inviting our uh, guests. I hope that uh, we'll be able to meet uh, together uh, next month. Uh, let's hope that maybe we'll we'll try to fix the date for uh, the 29th April, which is the, like the last Thursday of the month. Uh, you know, I, I, it's not fully uh, set yet because you know we have to agree with with potential speakers. But basically, we'll try to maybe fix uh, the the date just around uh, the end of the, uh, of the next month. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like also to, to thank uh, people from the SWPS University who help us with the promotion of the event, to Mrs. Natalia Cieślińska, to Mrs. Zofia Orły, to the whole team of Mr. Rafał uh, Sławski, who is coordinating the whole marketing and promotion uh, of, the, of the event. I would like also to, uh, to thank Oscar Sheshula from the IT department who is helping us to set everything uh, uh, together. But ladies and gentlemen, this seminar would not be possible if not involvement and huge uh, amount of wisdom that he wanted to share with us of Professor Martin Krieger. So please uh, join me in thanking Professor Krieger for his passion, for his dedication and for his great scholarship in rule of law. I think we are much wiser after today's uh, seminar in understanding what really rule of law is and why this ideal matters. Martin, thank you, thank you very much. Well, thank you all. I was really honored to be part of this and I will be part of, at least as a listener, part of the next three. Thank you. Thanks. So, so ladies and gentlemen, webinar is officially closed. Thank you very much. <laughs>